says we're live. Let me adjust this a little bit. So this is where the comments come up. Great. So I'll okay. take care of that. Okay. Hey guys, this is Helena. And can you guys hear us and see us okay? If for everyone watching, just type that into the chat. Things have been breaking down a lot lately. I'm here with my friend, Dr. Rob Heisinga. Say hi to everybody. Hi. Thank and you for uh, asking me to come on. <laughs> so he is, uh, I don't even know how to how to introduce you, uh, Associate Professor a professor at UCLA. UCLA, medical yeah. Medicine. Uh, he went to Harvard Medical School, right? They we say. See you. Thank you guys so much. Yes. And uh, what else? What else? He's well, also I've done that. a few things yeah. in terms of sports and weight loss, yeah. and, and I just kind of backed into this, and I thought, you know, you being the relationship guru, <laughs> um, you might want to hear about some yes, of yes, these yes, yes. Really things. important topic. I've actually been getting a lot of questions about this lately in my community um, over on Facebook, and so we wanted to bring him on, and we've also been friends for like, what, over 10 years now? It's so crazy. Seems like that. <laughs> wow. Over 10 years. So, and he's just this huge, been this big, uh, important influence in my life, really. Like, he, he knew me before. I influenced your knees. Yeah, sure. yeah. He's the reason I can even, like, walk just medically and just personally. He's had such a huge impact on my life. So, he just wrote a uh, an amazing book. Can we show everybody? Um, called Sex, Lies, and STD. The Very most proud of this. Before you swipe right. So, we're going to be talking about everything you need to know before sleeping with a guy. And if you guys have questions about this, this is the one to ask. So, type those into the comment section. Any STD related questions, sex related questions, anything like that, please let us know. Or any questions, actually, even if you just have regular questions, I can, if that's okay with you. Yeah. I can probably get to them. Anything medical. Yeah. And yeah. And he's also the world's leading weight loss expert. I've been getting a lot of questions on that. Is it the world? The country's leading um, weight loss expert? I at least the world. You know, the state of California. The state of <laughs> maybe the county of Los Angeles. Yeah. But. We've done a lot of research and we've got a lot of information, obviously, yeah. with all the, the the individuals that we've done large amounts of weight loss with. Right, right. So I know I'm getting a ton of weight loss questions, so I knew I was going to have to adjust this camera angle. I haven't done a live stream in so long. I miss you guys. Thank you so much for letting us know that you can hear us and see us okay. So as we're waiting for people to join, um, I'll, I'll just jump right in and ask you a couple questions, sure. right? Fire Type away. your questions in the into the chat too, you guys. So what what inspired you to write this book? I don't even know the answer to that, actually. Well, this was really a labor of love because about two years ago, I had a patient, Charlie Sheen, who unfortunately contracted HIV. And so he elected for a variety of reasons to come out and tell the world that he had HIV. And I was very happy he did because I knew by him announcing that he had this disease, it would help more people, it would have more of an impact than I could ever have as a doctor. So we both went on the Today Show together and had a little discussion with Matt Lauer. And lo and behold, one of the things Charlie said was, he had under a doctor's care, quote unquote, slept with several girlfriends. And remember, he had the diagnosis of HIV without a condom. That leashed a firestorm, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. of comments. And it turns out, that the reason I wrote this book was to answer to all the people online and in newspapers that were incredibly critical of the, you know, enabling doctor from Hollywood that would let a star sleep with women and quote unquote expose them when he had a disease as severe as HIV. And that's what I want to explain. Yes, I would love to hear all about that. Yeah, yeah you know, like you work with some of the most high profile people in the whole world. So I didn't, I don't know what's okay to say, what's top. Secret, yeah. Who is Charlie Sheet? So maybe some people, yeah. So I don't, I don't. I'll just let you say whatever you feel you can say. I don't know. What well, ethically, you could talk about people that have declared themselves uh, in the newspaper. <laughs> On the Today Show, he's, or he's, right? He's, okay. He's in the newspaper. And, <laughs> okay. So that's not secret. Okay, fantastic. So what, like, what is? Do you guys have questions about any of this? Let us know in the comment section. We're just kind of waiting for some more people to join too. Um, what is what I would like to like focus on today is like like prevention. Um, things that we can do to protect ourselves and, you know, other people. So um, speaking of sex crimes, interesting. Okay. So yeah, what, what are some things people can do to, and well, first maybe well, the, we should back up. What are like some common myths or like misconceptions? Well, that I'll tell you one about? of the misconceptions is that STDs are no big deal. And I'm here to say we've got a huge problem in America this year, 25 million individuals are going to get an STD. And right now, there's about 147 million Americans walking around with an active 
full on STD. The vast majority don't know they have it. So we have this huge problem with disease and we have another problem that people are unaware that they have this disease. Mm -hmm. Have you ever, I don't know if you've ever had a partner, I've seen a few where, you know, you're having this big discussion beforehand and the person says, oh, I've never had an STD. Mm -hmm. I'm perfectly clean, mm -hmm. right? Has anybody ever heard that? Have you guys ever heard that? Type that into the comment section. Someone's and I'll asking tell you, for the, the name of the book too. This is what it looks like. Sex, lies, and STDs. The must, the must read, read before you read. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so I've had partners say to me, I don't have an STD. How dare you ask? I've never had one. And you want to know something? Total BS. Because the vast majority of Americans, of even our viewers, have had an STD. Probably 99% of Americans have had one, mainly because some diseases like HPV are essentially ubiquitous. Okay. Got it. Are the ones without symptoms the most dangerous often? Well, it's very... Okay. Because, well, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, what do you think is the number one way STDs in America present? What's the number one thing? If it happens, you go, oh, might have an STD. What's the number one way that they present? I, I would think a symptom, right? What's the number one way? If you look at chlamydia, if you look at syphilis, if you look at HIV, if you look at HPV, what's the number one way they present? I don't know. I, I'm trying to think of like like some sort it's of a symptom. Trick question. Like a, I guess, it's a trick question. Knowing you, I know yours too. You, well, I, so the answer is probably no symptoms. You okay. got it. You got to see. She knows that I, know I do him. these trick I questions. Yeah. yeah. But everybody else thinks, oh, it must be some kind of a discharge. It must be some type right. of a burning right. on urination. It must be some type of a rash. No, that's a misconception. Okay. Because you have to be aware that if you're having intercourse, you're at risk, and you may get no symptoms. And we have this huge problem right now with women under 25, you know, 2 million plus or minus are walking around with chlamydia, putting themselves at risk for infertility, have no symptoms. And everybody thinks, well, I'm fine because I have no discharge. I have no urinary burning. I have no rash. I must be fine. Not true. Okay. That is really important, right? Okay. Any, uh, any STDs from only kissing? Ileana asks. Absolutely. If you kiss... You could pass herpes type one, obviously. You can pass HPV is a disease of the mouth. Syphilis is very commonly passed in the mouth. It's a rare disease relative to some of these others. So that kissing, uh, sex toys, just touching can cause a variety of STDs. Wow, I should have read the book before having you on because I would have read that. Well, hopefully like, you'll wow, read it afterward amazing. because yes. one of the other, uh, let me just mention another myth when I talk to people, they go, well, you know, I'm not going to read this book because if I'm worried or if I have a new partner, I'm just going to go online and I'll read. It's not online. It's not online. No, because I went to Harvard Med School. So I'm not going to say I'm the smartest person in the world, but I know a few things. And I spent two years writing this book and I couldn't find at least two thirds of the information in this book online. In other words, that is one of the things in here. I have a whole question, what STDs can you get by kissing? And it was impossible to find that out online. Wow. Wow. Okay. Um, Linus says this makes me not want to have sex ever again. Okay. I'm actually glad you said that because we're going to talk about how to protect yourself, how to prevent this. Because while we were talking right before Adam, I don't want to scare everyone into never having sex ever again. That's not what we're doing here. Right. Um, Sarah, let me just jump in. Okay. I don't want to scare anybody either. And but I want you to realize what's scary is not STD. Scary is lack of knowledge and inactivity uh, where you're not doing the right prevention and you don't make yourself aware. You're not knowledgeable. That's scary. The STDs, once you know what to do, how to prevent them, what to look for and how to monitor, then it's not scary anymore. Exactly. And we don't want yes. to prevent people from right. having relationships. Right. That should be encouraged. This is how to have relationships and not be scared and not get caught in arrears and have something happen down the road that you go, oh my God, I wish I would have read that stupid book. Absolutely. By the way, you guys, the book is in the description right now. If you're on a phone, you might have to close the live chat and click the description. It's just the first link. It's the only link in there. You can get it on Amazon. It's also on Kindle. We can include that link after. So we're getting a lot of great questions. Can, gen can genital warts infect the mouth if oral was performed? Yes. Genital warts is... HPV, but I want to make a really clear distinction because when I was a younger doctor, I was younger once, <laughs> we worried like crazy about warts. P 
people would get genital warts and they'd get oral warts or even warts in the nose and we would burn the bejeebies on them. And the poor women, it used to be standard that if they had vaginal warts, we would literally burn the whole vagina. It was really torturous treatment. And I want to say that we don't do that anymore. And this is the reason why. Warts are a cosmetic problem. They're unsightly and I wouldn't want them any more than anyone else, but they don't cause cancer. So you take care of the large ones, the the cosmetically egregious ones, but you don't have to worry about warts because there's two types of HPV, wart inducing and cancer inducing. Mm -hmm. We're only worried about cancer inducing. And so the warts will tend to go away on their own within a year or two. And yeah, we'll take away the obvious ones, but don't worry about warts anymore. And that's not really a critical problem to your health. Wow. So it's the one that don't have that symptoms so, that you have to worry about? It's, I think out of, there's some over 40 genital HPV and about half of them plus or minus cause warts, not an issue. And about half cause cancer, a huge issue. Okay. And that's the one that I want to focus on. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, someone asked, how can we protect ourselves then if we can get STD, STDs from kissing, which is now considered PG in the dating world? Anything do you have to say about that? Well, you have to know. You have to be aware of your status, number one. I mean, number one is let's not pass it to anyone else. So if you have episodic herpes, maybe we should be on a treatment to suppress that or to uh, nearly eliminate it, number one. And that's part of our problem. When people go to a doctor and they say, doctor, I want a complete STD check. I'm changing um, areas I live in. I, I have a new boyfriend. And the doctor tends not to do herpes test. So you don't even know if wow. you have it. Wow. And then maybe with a new partner, you should have your partner check. Then you know, and you can take proper prevention so that you don't get herpes back and forth. Have you gotten a vaccine for HPV? So you don't get that back and forth. Are you a high risk individual or is your partner a high risk individual to get syphilis or HIV? You have to know that. And then you can do proper screening before and during the relationship so that you never have to worry about kissing and passing something via kissing. Okay. Yes. Great answer to that. Somebody said, wow, I didn't know the difference between warts and HPV. Thank you. Uh, someone said they read in an article that herpes has been related to Alzheimer's. Do you know anything about that? There have been some recent articles that show some of these viruses that stay in your body, they cause chronic infection. They may heighten some of these aging diseases that are related to inflammation. And so that may be an issue. And, and, and one of my next things that uh, Lana is hopefully going to ask me back to talk about is aging and how that affects relationships, obviously. And one of the things is maybe everybody that has herpes should be on a prevention to lower the level of virus in the body, to lower your inflammation, to decrease your chance for these inflammation related diseases like Alzheimer's. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. We should. Do if you have any more questions about that specifically, let me know when I'm doing this. I'm just scrolling through the, okay. through the <laughs> good. I'm just making sure I didn't miss it. You guys have any other questions about this? This is really good. So can we talk about um, like how, okay. So let's say, um, okay. I think we got everything. I think we got all the questions. Um, can we talk about how to how to protect yourself? How to well, you said first obviously is the awareness, right? Knowing like what you are. You ready for the next for, question? Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you on the line a little bit. Today. Okay. Okay. Most people, a great form of protection is condoms. Condoms have been around for a long time, and they started out with animal intestine, and they they've become much more specific and scientific and reliable, but I have mentioned a fact. This year alone, it's estimated 25 million STDs will be passed. So we got 25 million STDs. If everybody conscientiously did condoms, every time everyone had intercourse, which obviously is not the case today, everyone used condoms. What percent of these 25 million STDs do you think would be prevented? Would we prevent 99%? I'll give you a couple of choices. Okay. Would we prevent 95%, would we prevent 90% or would we prevent 60%? 95%. 95%. 95%. 95%. 
knowing you, I'm going to say 60. <laughs> most you people would say that. Most you people know, would say she's 90. ruining everything. Do you, do, you, do you ruin everybody's I'm sorry, presentations I'm sorry. when you have them on? Most, I will say most people. <laughs> I think, yeah, she's yeah. obviously right. Yeah. It's shocking because I, right. before I looked into it several years ago, I would have never thought, I would have probably guessed 90% because 10% of people just don't get the hang of condoms. They don't put them on right. Obviously, condoms fall off at the end of intercourse, sometimes condoms break. And so you'd think, oh, okay, you know, people use them uh, very questionably. And most people would say 98% if they think everybody's using them great or 90%, but it's a very low number. This is the reason why. Condoms, when they're used properly, and they're used properly about 80% of the time. Okay. So if you look at pregnancy, you lower pregnancy by 80%. So the, the number you start with is 80% because 20% of the time there's an error in the use of condoms. Okay. And the reason it only works 60% of the time is the following. Condoms only prevent the passage of infections over the area that's covered. So it obviously covers a fraction of the penis, but there's a lot of other skin-to-skin -skin contact. What about HPV, skin-to-skin -skin transmission? What about herpes, skin-to-skin -skin transmission? What about syphilis, skin-to-skin -skin transmission? What about... Uh, pubic crabs. There's zero protection with condoms. So you've got a lot of STDs that are passed, even with totally proper use of the condom. Okay. So we, we better have other protection. We better be smart and think about other ways to protect ourselves. Do you have any of those other ways? Yeah, I have okay, a lot perfect, of those perfect. other ways. So let's stay tuned for that. Let's get to some of these questions. Wait, somebody said, I apologize, you've already said this. What's the doctor's name? Dr. Rob, I think this is what his book looks, looks like. It's called Sex, Lies, and STDs. The must read before you swipe right. Um, someone else said prevention is key. Love you, Helena. Your videos have helped me so much. Oh, uh, what's the best way to talk with men about sex and past relations? Um, we can definitely talk about that. Or, Fire okay, away. Okay, well, let, let me let me get to some of these other ones, too. Um, we'll get to all your questions, you guys. Can Should I just, can I say about what's the best way to talk to men about condoms and STD yeah, prevention? Yeah, absolutely. That would be amazing, yeah. I think women should say, and this is where, you know, there's a little stretch of the truth in some people, but say, I love sex with condoms because it makes me feel freer I don't have to worry about getting pregnant and I don't, I have a lesser worry about STDs and this is just a great thing. And women should bring condoms. Don't totally rely on the men. And it should be kind of a fun, positive discussion where, you know, this is something that you encourage and you say, this really helps me get totally into sex and helps me orgasm. And it's just a great thing. And you, you kind of put it out that way rather than what some people do. Oh, totally, I hate this, but I've totally. got to do it. Yeah. And, and wow. that's a downer all the way. I am very impressed with that. Okay. I would totally sign off on that and say, yeah, absolutely. Frame it as a positive and I feel that I feel safe, right? In order to feel uninhibited, you have to feel safe as a woman, right? Correct. That was really good. Maybe I should bring you on and we can do some more. <laughs> I don't know if you want to take I'm just, I'm trying to go in your shadow. Yeah, you know? that's pretty good. That was, I'm, I'm actually very impressed with I love it. Yeah. So, so I think that was a great answer. I'm going to say, let's go with, let's go with that one right there. Um, should this conversation happen even before a kiss? What, what are your things? I mean, what's the, I think that's getting a little extreme. I think that you should prepare for that kiss and things that could happen, but assuming somebody doesn't have a visible lesion <clears throat> and you don't feel the person is at tremendously high risk of STDs. And that's something else we can talk about. Who's at, we're all at risk. Who's at high risk. If somebody's at high risk, then I think you should have that discussion before you kiss. Because, by the way, maybe you don't want to kiss a guy that isn't interested in protecting you and vice versa. Maybe a guy shouldn't be interested in a woman that goes, ah, I don't need condoms. It's like, whoa, where have you been? What's going on? Uh, wow. Yeah. Amazing. I'm actually very impressed. It's scary. Yeah. We agree on stuff. Wow. It doesn't happen very often. <laughs> Okay, someone said, when is the right time to have this conversation? Then? Great question. Great question, you guys. I think the earlier in the relationship, the better. Okay. And I think that it should be an open, you know, discussion because I think it should be earlier than talking about whether you want to have kids and things like that because it's a much more important question. Yeah, and I think yeah. it's totally appropriate to have that earlier. And I think you can make it fun, too, by oh, are you probably one of those guys that has never had an STD? And then you go, ha, 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 I read this book, and that's BS, you know? I think that's a 
great. I think that's really good. I'm really surprised to have you give good advice. He does give good advice. He, uh, so he far, that. so good. I'm yeah. passing my finger. <laughs> Should you get an HPV vaccine at age 40 plus? What if you had it and went away? Do you still get the vaccine? Great question. Great question. Great question because, unfortunately, the more sexually experienced you are and the older you are, the more chance you've been exposed to a variety of STD strains. Now I said that there's plus or minus 40 sexually transmitted strains of, of HPV and the current vaccine is against nine of those strains. Uh, several of the most common causes of warts and several of the most common causes of the cancer, the cervical, the rectal, the penile, the possible esophageal and definite throat cancer. So should you have it at age 40? I say yes, absolutely. And again, the less experienced, the less partners and the younger, uh, the better off the results will be. But I still would, would do that. I was separated plus or minus at age 50 and I took the vaccine. That's all I can say. We know we actually had a question in my in my community over on Facebook, somebody asking, uh, they've heard that 50 plus, there's just a higher rate of STDs, there's a higher chance of it. Do you have anything to say on that? Because that's, that's, that's not true. The okay. highest rate of STDs are individuals less than 25. Okay. There certainly okay. are STDs in people that are, are, as they get older, obviously certain diseases like herpes that we unfortunately can't get rid of, the incidence of herpes type one and two goes up as you get older. Um, but, you know, hey, there's STDs in geriatric patients in nursing homes. So it's right. not like there's there's not a population that's that's immune to STDs. Okay, great, great. This is really good information. I had no idea what how this was going to go. We were just kind of going. We just kind of recorded and started, and started going. Um, let's see. So I'm going to keep up the great advice. You are the best. To stay, <laughs> I'm just tuning in now. It makes me want to stay celibate. Uh, if you're just tuning in now, we talked a little bit about that towards the beginning. I'll, I'll post the replay of this. Uh, well, let's, let's address that again. Okay. No one should be celibate. That's, that's totally right. not what this is about. Part of the quality of life is based on your relationships. And, and part of a relationship is based on, on your uh, sexuality. So the reason why I wrote this book is as we discussed earlier, there was criticism about an individual with HIV who turned out to be Charlie Sheen having relationships with women. And it's like, whoa, wait a minute. We now have HIV under wraps. We can give the individuals who unfortunately have HIV incredibly potent medication. They can now have intercourse with women without using condoms. This is like heresy. When I started out as a doctor, you had sex with somebody with HIV. That was like a felony. Right. You were asking to die. That doesn't happen today. Today, we have medicine that an HIV patient can take and they can freely have intercourse with a woman, assuming they're taking the medication without any fear of transmitting it and vice versa. If there's individuals gay or women having intercourse with people at high risk of HIV, they can take a drug called PrEP and they're not going to get the disease it's something like 99.9% uh, diminished. So these are huge, huge advances. We have to know about them though. We can't be so stigmatized that we go, oh, somebody has HIV, we won't touch them. Those days are long gone. Uh, and I have I have a question on that. So that that was amazing. <laughs> she said, yeah, I'm not giving on, up on sex forever. I was kidding, but awareness is good. Absolutely. Riley asks, okay, let me ask. So I think I saw you either on, was it like Good Morning America or the Today Show? Something you sent me where it was like, uh, you said that actually the risk of getting HIV, um, I don't know if I'm going to say this correctly. Uh, what what What's a higher risk? Now I'm doing these questions. Having sex without a condom with someone who has it, but's on the full cocktail of medications. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Or just having sex with some random stranger with a condom. Your chances of getting it are actually higher with the condom, with the stranger. Correct? Correct. Okay. And let me explain that. Can yeah, I? absolutely. Because yeah. everybody thinks, oh my God, if you had sex with somebody who has HIV, you're, 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 totally at risk. Right. Not true if the person's being fully treated. If the person's right. being fully treated, your chance is somewhat less than one in a hundred million. However, if you now go, let's say you're in Hollywood where I live near and you go to the hottest club, you go to catch, right? And you're a woman and you look around the club and you pick out the hottest looking guy there and you say, okay, I'm going to have, I'm going to have sex and one night stand with him tonight, but I'm going to use condoms. Turns out that because there are bisexual men, there are some heterosexual men with HIV that don't know they have it. Something like 
you know, 15% of people in our country who have HIV don't know they have it. So they may not even be lying. So you have intercourse with that person. You use a condom. I already said condoms only work 80% of the time. There is something like three or 400,000 Americans who are at risk for spreading HIV. It's not fully treated. So you multiply all those odds. It turns out if you have sex with the best looking guy in a club, your chance of getting HIV is a hundredfold more than if you have sex without a condom with an individual who I'm treating has who has HIV. Wow. Shocking, that right? That blew my mind when I heard well, it. Right? That's, that's pretty crazy. That right? is yeah. why I, I, I wrote this book. I'm, I'm holding it upside down. That doesn't, the book's better than holding it upside okay. down. So, and, and I really think that when people read it, they aren't going to want to be celibate. They'll go, okay, I've got it. I've got it down. I know what to look for. I'll do my regular checks. I'll do my prevention. I'll take my vaccines. I'll take my pre medications. I'll use condoms appropriately. I'm not going to worry. I'm going to, okay. I'm going to enjoy. I like that. I like that. But okay. Really good. Somebody asked, um, is HSV one considered an STD? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. HSV one is herpes simplex virus one. And it turns out that in today's world, this isn't true when I, you know, started being a doctor, but today, 50% of genital attacks of herpes, herpes that comes out around the vagina, rectum, penis, 50% of those attacks are herpes type 1 and 50% are herpes type 2. So, of course, herpes type 1 is considered a sexually transmitted disease. Also, if you have oral sex with somebody who has genital herpes type 1, you could get oral herpes from that during a sex act and vice versa. If you... Uh, have herpes type one, you can give that herpes type one genitally to your partner during a sex act. So absolutely unequivocally, herpes type one can be passed non-sexually as a, as a young individual getting kissed from your grandmother or grandfather. Don't want to be too sexist. Mm -hmm. And after puberty, it can be passed sexually. And it turns out herpes type one is now passed about half uh, as a as a pediatric juvenile. Uh, from a family member, and half of it is passed uh, sexually. Wow. I had no idea about this. Somebody also, uh, uh, Frankie asked, what about hepatitis A, B, and C? Do you know anything about Well, that? hepatitis A, B, and C are also sexually transmitted diseases. And yeah, I do know a little okay. bit about those. <laughs> um, hepatitis B and C are the main ones because they have severe ramifications. Hepatitis A does kill some individuals. I think the first thing is, wake up, America. Why wouldn't you get vaccinated? against hepatitis A and B. It turns out hepatitis A is not a mandatory vaccine, but in California, just a couple of years ago, there was a big outbreak and over a hundred people died. I mean, this is insane, right? Um, and hepatitis A can be gotten from, you know, contaminated food, contaminated water, but it also can be passed sexually. But the big things are hepatitis B and C are passed sexually. Again, hepatitis B, please take a vaccine because that's a lethal viral infection and hepatitis C, is less often passed, very rarely passed sexually, but can be passed sexually. We think most hepatitis C is obtained through dirty needles. And um, a lot of people born in the 50s and 60s for some reason have hepatitis C. And we think there was some major breakdown in terms of uh, needle use back in those areas, whether it was in doctor's offices or whatnot. You know, uh, I remember when I was a kid, they kind of, you know, they, they would put the needles out on trays out in the open and something happened there. But hepatitis C can be passed and is a sexually, but rarely so. Okay. Okay. Wow. This is really, this is really good. Very, but I didn't know that this was going to be so like, <laughs> I'm really, I'm really happy about all this. Somebody says, um, uh, yes, we are just going to be smart about it. Channels like this empower men and women. Oh, thank you, Frankie. Um, how often should one get tested after every partner where you don't know about their sexual history? I would say before. A new, right? I agree or with you. I think that before you start a new relationship, you should get tested. And even during a relationship, because you're not 100% sure of the other person's uh, fidelity, you should get tested probably every six to 12 months. I would like to say one other thing about women empowerment and STDs. Interestingly, you know, for a while, women got blamed for STDs. I don't know if people know this, but, you know, you see a lot of those World War II posters and it was like, this woman is bad. She could be spreading diseases. Stay away. So it was almost like women got blamed. And the other thing that's really interesting is women bear the brunt of STDs. I don't know if you knew that. No, I didn't Lena, know that. But um, you take certain diseases like, let's say, chlamydia. 
women have a far higher Ooh, incidence sorry. of chlamydia than do men. Women have it twice as frequently as men. Uh, interestingly enough, men are twice as contagious as women. And women, since they have twice as much chlamydia, the, the, the rate is twice as high. And same thing with herpes. Women have it twice as high. The, the side effects and the damage specifically in chlamydia and fertility, and we're now finding out maybe ovarian cancer is slightly higher in women who have had chlamydia for a while. So they're, they're, they're bearing the brunt of some of the side effects of this. And, um, you know, it's something that's really important to discuss. I, yeah, absolutely. You, the, my whole screen just went blank for a second. Can you guys see us? And still, I always get there. There's always something. There's always some issue. My just, mind went if blank you right your that, screen. Did like, you see that? that was coincidence? I like freaked out that? for a second. I'm like, oh my God. Okay. So yeah, just let us know if you can see us and everything. We'll keep going through the questions. I hope everything's okay. Um, do they make body condoms? <laughs> oh my God, they're so funny. Um, so well, hang on, hang on. Because a lot of people don't know about this, you know, because that's the joke. You know, I'm going to wear a double body condom. But there are female condoms, and a lot of people don't realize this, but they are very effective, and you know, probably everybody should try them and just see how you feel with them, because um, you know, there are certain instances where, say, a male is uh, potentially not wanting to do that, and um, it's something that that is worth checking out. I think. Okay, great, good job. Oh, so um, the HS. H as some these these comments are so tiny. Can you even see these HSV? over here? It just be one. Your for, eyes are better than mine. So I, if this is all in you reading the comments. Going, I'm my eyesight is going a little bit too. I, so I, hey, hey. Um, can it be deadly for a baby? HSV one. Yes. Okay. The the herpes. One of the big points in this book is that herpes is totally overhyped and stigmatized. And so I want to just say that over and over. But the, the one problem is this minuscule percent of pregnancies are put in harm's way by the passage of herpes. And it turns out, interestingly, when you talk about uh, babies getting herpes, about half is herpes type one and half is herpes type two. So it, you have some from both. But I think there's something like a little less than 400,000 pregnancies every year in America. And there's probably 500 of those pregnancies where the baby uh, is exposed and catches herpes. And of those 500, half are infected severely. So it's something that needs to be discussed and needs to, we need to look at it. And the people at risk, because people go, well, I don't have herpes. You're the one at risk. So if you're a woman and you're pregnant and you haven't had herpes and you never had herpes, well, we, we should check your husband or your partner. Because if they have herpes and you catch it during the pregnancy, that's the highest risk of transmission. So everybody's like, I don't have herpes. I'm pregnant. I don't have to worry. No, we have to test your husband. And then you would say, well, I asked my husband. He doesn't have herpes. I'm cool, right? Right. Is that okay? Well, I have a feeling you're going to say no. no because 90% <laughs> of people that have herpes don't know they have it. So you look wow. at your husband and you say, I don't have herpes. And then the husband goes, I don't. Well, the fact of the matter is doctors never test for herpes. And 90% of herpes individuals don't know that they have it. And so you need to get tested, in my opinion. Absolutely. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's see. Frankie asks, does the doc have a channel? <laughs> yeah, I think you do. I'm, a, <laughs> I'm like a moderator on his YouTube <laughs> channel. I think he has like three. Well, I do, I do have a YouTube <laughs> channel, Dr. Heisinger. And yeah, we're doing some things. And, and Lana actually helped me where we're trying to publicize awareness through yeah. kind of, you know, funny videos. And so, yeah, go to, uh, you know, at, search, at Dr. Heisinger uh, yeah, and yeah. look at some of the videos we're trying to do uh, about STDs to bring out the insanity about people not wanting to talk. Doctors don't want to talk because people look at me sometimes. They say, wait a minute. How can Americans this year going to have 25 million infections like that's a breakdown. And I'm like, yeah, the public health system broke, right? Where no money is channeling into it. We have people like our president and parts of what he does is good. But here's a guy that didn't know the difference between HSV and HPV and, you know, is not really helping the public health system. And then you've got doctors. Most doctors are too embarrassed to look you in the eye and say, how many partners do you have? Are you doing high risk activity? Do you take drugs associated with sex? Um, are, do you, what type of sex 
are, do you like? Do you like oral sex? Do you like vaginal sex? Do you like rectal sex? Because each one of those types of intercourse has its own specific risks and things that we have to watch at. And then the doctors then also, I hate to say this, but aren't savvy enough to order the right tests with the right infections. For instance, very few doctors test for herpes, and that's why we get these problems with pregnancy. Very few doctors test for mycoplasm, which is a disease very similar to, to chlamydia. So you walk out and you go, I just got tested. My doctor did everything. And I, I look at the test and I go, no, your doctor did not do everything. Really? Really. Wow. I feel like you should do it. Do you want to be like the medical um, expert on my channel? We could do this like every like. Well, we this should just really do good, this over and over because I I'm, know. I'm, as you know, I'm passionate about this. Stuff. Absolutely. And, and I have to admit, I'm not the world expert on infectious diseases. You know, I was a, a sports doctor and I was a, uh, a weight loss doctor on Biggest Loser and, and I spent a lot of time researching those subjects. But when I saw the level of ignorance and the level of stigma associated with Charlie Sheen coming out with his HIV, I said, this is shocking. And I was criticized. I probably wouldn't have done this if I didn't get criticized so much in the press. I said, I'm going to write a book and talk about these crazy newspaper reporters putting falsehoods, lies, and increasing the stigma, not helping. And I want to write a book so that people can understand it. And that's why I'm here today. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Love. He's a really good writer too. He's written a lot of different books. You guys can search for him on Amazon, but he, <laughs> the way he writes is really entertaining. Do I have like, to I, pay for those? <laughs> Do I have to pay for those? No, those, no, just saying, that I'm just saying you're a good writer. Like my, like Thank Margaret you very said, much. my I mom has that. your book on oh, uh, weight loss. So uh, nice. I think she's probably watching this because she's, I mean, my mom's a nurse. She's very interested in public health and she used to teach about this stuff when I was younger. So, um, yeah, so he's an amazing if her writer. her mom's reading it, that's like the, I, highest, <laughs> the highest compliment. <laughs> well, she just likes you too. So, you know what I mean? Like, she's like, oh, I haven't seen him in a while. That's, <laughs> um, but I, yeah, it's just really, but what I'm saying is this isn't just some boring, medical book like he's a really good he's a really good I writer he's that. entertaining i wish i i do not have that skill i wish i did though because it's you're, really you're, you'll, you'll write your <laughs> own books. um so does your book discuss vaccines like gardasil someone's asking absolutely okay my book not only discusses it but i went into a huge i think it took at least 10 15 20 pages there is a mass amount of information and misinformation about vaccines and specifically HPV. So what I did was go through every possible and every proven side effect of Gardasil because there is a lot of concern. Mm -hmm. And just as an example, there was an article in, I believe it was a Toronto newspaper saying the Gardasil vaccination in young women caused a number of severe complications. And that in Canada caused this massive amount of consternation. Well, what happened? First off, the entire article was misreferenced and, and they basically found it was totally slanted and they had to pull the entire article and retract it. But that didn't help all these individuals in Canada who had read this article and had fear placed. So what they did in Canada was because of that article and the incredible fear and the lack of uptake of that vaccine in Canada, they did a special study, a prospective study, the best medical study possible with 400,000 young Canadian women. And they followed them over a very long number of years. And that study has just come out showing no side effects long-term with this. There mm -hmm. are anecdotal reports, but they're in the hundreds about side effects that are anecdotally associated, but not proven to be associated. In other words, if you take a vaccine and five weeks later, you have some sort of weird mononucleosis-like syndrome, well, that needs to be reported. We need to follow it, but it doesn't mean the vaccine caused that. So this is what you've got. On this hand, you've got no proven side effect ever. And you've got maybe 100, 200 in America anecdotal cases of something bad happening temporarily related to the vaccine. On this hand, how many people you think die every year from HPV? Oh, in our country, how many people die? How many? I have no idea. 12,000. Wow. Every year. Wow. That's cervical cancer. That's oral cancer. That's rectal cancer. And that's other, you know, um, vulvar cancer, penile cancer, and probably other cancers, including esophageal. So worst case scenario, a couple of hundred people get a side effect. I don't really buy that, but it's a possibility. Mm -hmm. On this hand, 12,000 proven people dying every year without any question. Get your kids vaccinated at age... Wow. 13, 14, why that young? 
because their immune system is better and they only need two shots. And there's no proof that kids that are vaccinated early would be, will be more uh, prone to have early sex or will be right. have, have right. any right. change right. in their sexual mm-hmm. approach. So I, I think it's a slam dunk. And, and including we should then vaccinate people, and we talked about this earlier in the show, all the way up to the 50s if they haven't had you know, a massive amount of exposure. Okay, okay. Wow, this is really important. Everyone's, oh, by the way, I know you probably can't read this tiny it's writing, all but I know but I'm <laughs> counting on you. <laughs> but what everyone's saying this is so, you know, like great information. Um, someone asked, should you make your monogamous partner get checked also periodically in the relationship? What do you have to say about that? I, I would absolutely. Really? I mean, if you, if every shekel is vital, then maybe, you know, we can go back to the old fashioned trust. But if, if you have insurance, Absolutely. Okay. Okay. De- oh, oh gosh. Look at all these questions. You go, there's so many questions. Amazing. Someone else asked if you have a channel. Maybe we should build up your YouTube channel a little bit. How yeah. Many subscribers you have like 13 right Maybe now. Maybe two okay. or three. Is that a lot yeah, or is that not that I was on like kind of like an admin on his YouTube Are you channel. Impressed? I was like, what is, I was like, what is this? What are well, you I'm doing? a doctor. I don't, you, you know, doing? I'm actually learning from my friend Lana. Okay. Oh. It's, it's a wild world. I know how to write and I know how to be a doctor, but you know, uh, YouTube isn't my specialty, but I, I'm, I'm amazed at what Lana has done. And, and, um, um, so it's, it's amazing. Our, I just, I feel like this writing is getting smaller and smaller. Are home STD tests reliable? Great question. I actually have no idea. What's the answer to that? Home STD checks. Let's talk about the main home check, which is the the uh, HIV home check. It is not quite as accurate. And so anybody that's worried that they have contracted HIV in the last week or two, you have to repeat the home test something like uh, two months later. And so I think it's a good test. It can be very helpful, but it's not as accurate as the in-office test. So therefore, you have to repeat it at about two months, and then it does become quite accurate. But if you're just doing a one-time test, if you had a, a scary exposure that you believe was high risk several weeks ago, then you're better, better to do the test in office where we have some really excellent um, genetic tests that can detect the disease very, very quickly. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Great. Um, let's see. Someone else asked, what's the best way to tell your boyfriend you have herpes simplex one? Um, you did such a good job with that other thing. Like, do you want to, do you have any, anything to say well, about that's, that? That's a whole three or four pages in my book. And it, <laughs> really? And it, and it, and it ranges mean, from just, you know, just taking the bull by the horn and, and kind of going, hey, any guy that can't handle me having any sort of STD, whether that's herpes type one, herpes type two, HIV, chlamydia, do you really want that person around? Um, And the reason why it's scary to tell somebody you have herpes, whether it's type one or two, is stigma. Uh, The disease is not a bad disease. Okay. The disease is totally controllable, but the stigma needs to be handled. And we have to educate ourselves and then we can educate our partners. And so I think that to answer your question, it ranges from being very upfront early on to even taking precautions so that you can't pass the disease and getting a little bit closer to your partner so you don't, quote unquote, scare them off. And I've heard people argue from both sides, and there's there's pros and cons to, to those two different ways okay. to approach it. Okay. I really like that. I think that was really good. I don't even have anything more to add on that. Um, can HPV go dormant and for how long? Great question. Absolutely. So, okay. so if you have relations with an individual today, you can get exposed to the cancer causing HPV and it can remain dormant for anything from several years, usually five to 10 years is how long it typically goes dormant all the way to 20 years. So if you have relations today, you need to continue to do HPV monitoring in the old days, we did pap smears for surgical cervical cancer. You have to do continual monitoring for at least 20 years after that exposure because, yes, the viral infection that can cause cancer can go dormant for up to 20 years. Okay. Great. But you won't have to worry about that if you took the vaccine. Really? You're not going to have to okay. worry about okay. that. And the other thing I'd like to get in, just because I like to talk, <laughs> we don't do pap smears anymore. Really? What do you think about that? I mean, the last time you went to your gynecologist, did were they doing pap smears? I, 
I, I believe so. What do you mean? They don't do them anymore? What we do don't do them anymore because there's a more efficacious way to monitor for cervical cancer, and that's doing a HPV test every five years. So we now we used to do just a pap smear. Then we said, let's do a co-test. Let's monitor for HPV virus, especially the scary ones that are cancer causing, and do a pap smear together. Now we just monitor for these cancer causing HPV. Virus. Really? When now, you say it, we, who's we? Like the medical gynecologist community? Gynecologist and the medical all of it, that's community. Everybody, right. or? So the next time you go to your gynecologist you, and they say, we're just going to do a pap smear, I would be very suspicious because that's not the way we do it anymore. That's great to know. That's so great to know. So that's every five years. Somebody every has, five years. we. That's assuming somebody has no symptoms and okay. they started out without a problem. Right. If somebody we monitor every five years has the HPV virus, then, it then, then we do a different monitoring okay. thing okay. with somebody that is infected. Interesting. Okay, <clears throat> this is great. Oh, Anya's watching. You guys, Anya was here all day filming some great stuff for, for this channel. So stay tuned for that. Anya is my friend who I'm going to do the weight, the, uh, the weight oh, loss great. thing with that he's trying to be a part of. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see about that. I um, think Lanya, okay. she realizes she can't stop me from talking. I know, you know right? That may, I know. Um, may end that quickly. My doctor always gives me blood tests for STDs. That's the one thing I can say about him. Um, just join the late. What's the name of the book, please? Can you hold the book up again? Sex, Lies, and STDs. And, and hopefully this is like a must read for anybody that's going to swipe right. Because, you know, before you do, that's another risk factor we didn't talk about, casual dating. Uh, dating associated with drugs and alcohol. You know, these are these are situations where you want to even be more on your game vis-a-vis -vis prevention. Okay, good. Um, do you have to ask to specifically to be tested for herpes? Someone asked? Yes, you do. In okay. many cases, if you just say, I want everything done, most doctors, not all, there are some doctors that will include that, but most doctors, you have to have, you know, basically read this book and literally tell the doctor, okay, I want all the STDs done. And, and then after they say, yes, I will, you say, did you include herpes? Did you include mycoplasm? And um, if they give you an attitude, blame it on Dr. Rich. Okay, okay. Someone said, I read that the supplement L-lysine naturally suppresses HSV-1. Is that true? It works great in the test tube, but not so good in the human being. Really? Yeah. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Well, L-lysine, if you have the virus in a test tube, can affect it, but in... in the normal situation where you have herpes stays dormant in your nerve system, right? Oral herpes stays in a, a nerve ganglion here and genital herpes stays in a nerve ganglion down in the lower spine. You know, L-lysine doesn't really affect the transmissibility and the infectiousness of those viruses. Wow, and then there's everyone out there. You hear everybody say like, oh, just take- There's a ton of online wow. BS. <laughs> Who would have thought, right? Um, the book name is in the description. Yes, yes. Everyone, you can go uh, get the book on Amazon. We included the link there too. And it's also, if you want to do Kindle, there's part one and part two because they couldn't get it all on one. And then if you want to do an audio book and hear my cratchety voice <laughs> and Charlie Sheen doing the intro, that's that's also oh, something Charlie, they could the do. For the, does he write right. the intro in the yeah, book Yeah, he's too? got the intro in the book okay. too. Okay. Um, Charlie was really kind to me and let me talk a little bit about his case as well. So I'm uh, forever indebted to Charlie for his efforts to really bring this disease, HIV, out into the open and to help me write this book and to, to, to help me get it out there. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. He doesn't need to be doing any stuff like this. He just does it because he's passionate about it. Yeah. And same with all of them. He's a, and he's an amazing writer. So you guys will be entertained and actually write by the book, I would think. I think there's some interesting parts because yeah. I start the book out with kind of an interesting vignette that's interesting to me. I don't know. Let, <laughs> let me try it on you. I should have probably run it by you first. <laughs> but it just so happens that when I started out, I hate to admit how long ago, I took care of one of the very first HIV patients in the world that was described. And then I haven't seen HIV patients predominantly because that's a specialty. And then suddenly 75 million HIV patients later, I get another patient with HIV, Charlie Sheen. So I get to talk a little bit about taking care of the first and the 75th million patient with HIV and what happened in between. And, and it's, it's an amazing journey, what happened in a very few number of decades. Okay, amazing. So, so get the book. Someone says they're not seeing it. If you're on the phone, Frankie, close the live chat, and then you can click on the description. If you're on the computer, you should just see it in the description. Um, my daughter in Canada got Gardasil. She is fine. No side effects. Uh, 
Great, right? Great. Thank you for that, Jessica. Did, did, did Jessica, did you read that article in the uh, in the Toronto newspaper? Did it did it freak you out? Did you did you hear about that? I think it was three, four, five years ago. Yeah, let us know. Let us know. Wow, twelve k people are surprised that twelve thousand people die every year from. Uh, I'll ask you a question about that. How many of those individuals are cervical cancer? How many of those individuals are oral cancer? Oh. Because we have know. all these these crusades, you know, for cervical cancer, and everybody thinks HPV, it's a cervical cancer causing thing, and they think HPV, it's a woman's disease, right? Only women have to worry about it. What do you think? I would say not only women have to worry about it. Men get the preponderance of the oral cancers, and the oral cancers are just about to surpass the number of cervical cancers. So who is the world famous individual that has oral cancer that just brought it out into the headlines? Michael Douglas, right? Right. I was so Michael it, Douglas yeah. went in, and I'd love to talk about that too, because there was a little battle between who caused the cancer, which was was something that I think was a stigmatizing discussion, and, and really, I talk about it in the book as well. If people are interested in the whole thing with Michael Douglas, really? Yeah. Okay, that's in there too. Okay, all right. I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna. Should read. I have charged extra for gonna, that? No, story? no, I'm definitely gonna read. I promise. I, he told me to read it before he came over, and I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll get to it. <laughs> Famous but I will, story, but I, right? will, I will. Um, I don't see it on the, okay. So Millie, I will, I'll, I'll make sure the link is in like the comment section too, for people. Sometimes it, it, during the live chat, it doesn't come up in the description. Once I publish this, it'll be easier. So, um, everyone, yes, go, please, please go buy the book. My son has been vaccinated for HPV and he's 15. Somebody says, um, got you it. Made the, you made the right decision. Got it when he's Yes. Oh, uh, how many people you think, how many, the a woman just said her 15 year old son got vaccinated. So we're in America. We have a disease that's causing 12,000 deaths every year. And I'll just, I'll let you know that HIV, which is just this abominable disease, that's killing 6,000 a year. So we have a disease killing twice as many people as HIV in our country. So we have a, we have a treatment, complete cure for it. You just take the vaccine. So what percent of America is taking advantage of this amazing revolutionary prevention of the worst, most killing STD we have. What percent of America is taking advantage of this? Do I get multiple choice options for this one? Or yeah. I would say, okay. 90%, 50%, 20%. I'm going 20%. It's less than 50%. It's uh, okay. more than 20, thank God. <laughs> I wanted you to get <laughs> one question option? wrong. You had gotten all the ones right. I'm gonna, I wanted to trick you, right? Anyway, okay. less than 50, that's shocking to me. How can someone let their child be exposed to this horrible disease later in life and potentially get cancer? Cervical cancer happens a lot younger than the oral cancer, but it's it's not right. It's not right, and that's a, that's a big part why I wrote the book, too, is I know people that are anti-vaxxers, and they, they have some bits of truth, but but you have to look at it in total. You have mm -hmm. to look at the amount of deaths caused, the amount of devastation, not only deaths, what about all the people that get these kind of moderately abnormal pap smears and they're freaked out and then they have to get all these various procedures, some of which when they're done poorly cause infertility. This wow. is not This is not something that you want to mess around with and say, because some anti-vaxxers say, well, we'll just do... We'll do the HPV test. We'll do the pap smear every year. No, that's not adequate. And that's mm -hmm. not as good as getting a vaccine. Wow. Not as good as getting a vaccine. No, Amazing. because wow. you still have to do all these tests and procedures. Right. It's right. more expensive. And some of the tests and procedures have side tests. Okay. Wow. This is great. Great information. Uh, how do you tell your boyfriend you have herpes one? We, we talked about that, right? You, maybe you were just joining. Um, whatever you said before was really good. What, what was that? Well, I think that it's always important to have these discussions. It's always important to be honest. And there are two different schools. One is you just come right out and you say that you have herpes one, which can be something that you got as a youth. And, you know, for some reason that sounds better than if you got it sexually. And so if you wanted to lie and say you got it as a kid, be my guest. But, you know, you have to, you have to get it out eventually. Some people wait until they're a little bit you know, more attached to the person. But if that's the case, then you have to be taking some kind of prevention so that you don't pass it to your partner. God forbid you're doing French kissing, you're having oral sex, 
various acts where that herpes one could be transmitted. Okay. Okay. Uh, everybody is asking um, how to spell your last name. <laughs> well, I only learned this a couple of years ago, but it's uh, Dr. Heisinger. H-U-I, the U is silent. So it's H-U-I-Z-E-N-G-A. You want to maybe hold that up yeah. to the camera? Yeah. So is it going to be backwards? I, I don't know if it is. I think they up. spelled it right here. Yeah. Okay. Rob Heisinger, H-U-I-Z-E-N-G-A. Okay. I'm also online. I probably still go by Dr. H, but they always call me on Biggest Loser, but okay. um, that's that's cheaper. Okay. Oh, somebody copy and pasted your name and the, oh, thank, thank you, you Angelics, and the name of the book. Amazing. You two actually seem to have great chemistry. <laughs> We've been, we're like weird, unlikely best friends. We've been, I think that, that there's like, mirrors and smoke. Yeah. Do they see the smoke oh, right there? <laughs> Yeah, we've been, he's like a, he's like a family member to me. We've been for, I mean what over a decade, over yeah. a decade. He's met my whole family. She couldn't walk. I, I could yeah, he's the reason I can walk. Don't even again. we should do a he's show a, about knees. I know. I had all these crazy knee surgeries and everything and it if it scary. weren't for, I mean honestly, if it weren't for him, I would not have a, a normal life. I can you have a Facebook channel on crutches? On I mean, crutches, yeah. Years? I was on crutches for what? Two yeah, years? Long time. Two years? That was, was back in like sad. You were like thinking you're never going to walk. I did, like, yeah. No doctor scary. could figure it out. I was spending all this money on all these painful treatments. He took one look at my MRIs. He knew the exact surgery I needed, very kind of weird, rare thing. And he Not set many. me up yeah, with There was, the, I think, one doctor in all of Los Angeles that did yeah, the surgery one. you needed. Yeah, up in Palmdale. And he, yeah. he got me in with him, and, and it changed my life. It, was, it took me nine months to learn how to walk again, but I'm, I have a normal life now. Thanks to him. Thanks to I, him. I appreciate it. A, yeah, huge, important important person <laughs> in my life. Uh, let's see. Um, can you get HPV from a toilet seat? Um, you can't get HPV from a toilet seat, but if you do buy the book, you can see I have one chart that I'll keep secret of the different diseases you could get if you try on clothes in a department store without your underwear, or you're doing Airbnb and you walk into your bathroom and it hasn't been properly cleaned. So there are some mm -hmm. things, but it's pretty rare when you get STDs passed with bed sheets or STDs passed on toilet seats, uh, it's it's reportable. So it's possible, but incredibly rare. Wow. Okay. Uh, my gyno had told me I don't need any more pap smears. That's what we were talking about earlier, right? What pap smears, uh, we don't do anymore. We do something that's, that's like a pap smear. So you have to do the same kind of speculum and you go in and do a scraping of the cervix, but you scrape the cervix for HPV virus not cells on the cervix, which is what a pap smear is. Okay. Okay. You've got a good gynecologist, so I like your gynecologist. Oh, okay. That's that's good. So that yeah, that was Stacy. Awesome. Thank you for that, Stacy. Um okay, yeah. People are getting click the upside down triangle. Somebody said yes. Okay, good. People are seeing the link. We were having some technical difficulties <laughs> before we started. So I'm glad it's working. Um love this. Thank you. I've learned so much. I'm buying copies for my friends too. Amazing. Thank you guys. Wow. Must read. And just by the way, the only people that really should read this are people that are having sex or know people that are having sex. <laughs> Other than that, I don't think, you know, don't bother to read it. Um, someone said, uh, the other uh, gynecologist said I was good as long as I stay monogamous and my partner does that I'm safe. Um, problem is I've since gotten divorced. So their gynecologist. Well, wait a minute. Saying, when you get divorced, that's a period where you've been with one individual for a long time and you definitely have to have a new game plan for your sexual experiences. And one thing is you haven't had that many partners for a long time. Clearly, regardless of your age, probably the HPV vaccine is a consideration. Mm. Clearly, you need to have a game plan vis-a-vis -vis your age and pregnancy, and then you have to have a game plan vis-a-vis -vis STDs. And we haven't got a chance to talk about it, but there's a lot of other diseases that are sex-related that aren't transmitted, and you have to have a plan for those as well. Oh, my gosh. We might have to do a part two of this. You know, we've been doing this for like an hour. And I was like, we might have a part two. Do I get water I if I go so. past an hour, I, or is that I not included? I to say, well, do you need water? I can grab no, it no, right there. Are you sure? Oh, no, my gosh. I usually have it. I know you yes. probably want me to have a raspy voice. So oh, my God. I'm so sorry. That's got to, you know. Um, does Gardasil cause problems with infertility? I'm going to grab you water while you answer that. Okay. There's no. I'm Are you fine. sure? I'm just Are you sure? I'm okay. You. I need one There has too, never actually. been a documented case of Gardasil causing any issues with fertility. On the other hand, not taking Gardasil and getting the virus HPV clearly has problems with fertility. Number one, if you get the serious kinds of cancer causing HPV, you need 
cervical surgeries that make you infertile. And number two, sometimes even uh, biopsies and inappropriately done testing for abnormalities of pap smears can cause infertility. So I would put the onus is the other way that HPV infections and uh, some of our diagnostic techniques rarely lead to infertility. So uh, it's, this is not a vaccine thing. The vaccine increases your relative fertility versus not doing it. Wow. Okay. Kim asks, do people that have, have had a hysterectomy have to worry about STDs? Great question. Yeah, great question. If you don't, if you if you take out your cervix and you just have the vaginal lining, of course you have to worry because there's a lot of skin to skin STDs. HPV goes skin to skin and can get inside, and you could still get rectal cancer. You could still get vulvar cancer. I've seen two women that have cancer on the outside of the vagina from HPV. You can still get crabs. You can get herpes. The fact of the matter is, I can't think of a disease you can't get. I can think of complications you might not get. In other words, chlamydia, for instance, you get the infection in your vagina and then it travels up your tooth. Well, if you've had a hysterectomy, it can't travel up your tooth. So you may get the infection and get less complications if you've had a hysterectomy. But absolutely, there's not an STD you can't get. You just might not get quite a severe complication. Okay. Okay. Fantastic question, Kim. Thank you for that. Renee asks, are there natural sub supplements that suppress HSV, HIV, or HPV? There are no natural over-the-counter supplements that okay. do that. I knew you were going to say that. That's why I was <laughs> I could have answered that one, actually. Um, yes, I did. Jessica from Canada says, yes, I did read the Gardasil article. No, I didn't freak out. I know better about this news hype. CDC says that boys need it, too. Yeah. Good. You're right on. Amazing. Jessica is like, uh, maybe she should do the part two. I, I mean, know, Jessica no, from Canada has got the answers. I forgot to tell you that I have the best audience on YouTube. Like, the wow. smartest, wow. most are, intelligent, this amazing is an informed people. Audience. Yeah, very, very intelligent. That. Yeah. But um, I, I still think you're going to, Jessica, want to read this because, you know, we have a vaccine against nine strains. There are 40 strains. So we're not all the way there yet. And we still need to know about HPV, even though we've got a prevention against the worst ones, but there are still other things we need to know. Okay. Amazing. Yeah. Maureen says if herpes simplex two is dormant for 30 years, it's still contagious. And do you need to worry? Unfortunately, 90% of individuals with herpes type two have no outward appearance, have no really signs or symptoms. Wow. And so, yes, you have to worry because unfortunately, sadly, you can have no symptoms. You can think the virus is dormant and you can still pass it. So yes, you need to get tested. And yes, if you have it, you need to discuss it with your partners and do the appropriate prevention treatment. Mm -hmm. Heather says, I've had both HPV and had, I've had both HPV and had to have a hysterectomy at 25 due to cervical cancer, unfortunately. Oh, wow, wow. Thank you for sharing your experience there. Um, okay. Let me say one thing that was Heather that had that. Yeah. First off, that that's a tragedy. And thank God we have, Probably the best cancer test in medicine heretofore is the pap smear, and you're an example of that. But I just want to say something else. You know you had HPV, and you had a, a bad complication of it. But the sad thing is 99% of us have had HPV before the vaccine came out, of course, mm. and don't right. realize it. And many individuals aren't doing the proper prevention. You're lucky you got the proper prevention. But we need to raise awareness. And this is what I was saying to Lana, too, whether she had ever had any, you know, uh, partners that say, I've never had an STD. And this is why I laugh at those people. And one of the things we point out in the book is all of us is, have had an STD, mainly because 99% of us has, have had HPV by the time we get to be 25 or 30. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Um, is it true that there is no HPV test for men? That is not true. Uh, there is no clearly scientifically documented cancer prevention test for men. In other words, we don't have a way to detect penile cancer or throat cancer in men, but we do have an oral gargle where you gargle and you spit it out and we can detect whether you have oral HPV. We just don't know whether that is a helpful test that predicts that you're at risk for cancer and we should do something. We get nervous if we do a test on men and say, well, you've got the scary HPV. You've got HPV 16 or HPV 18. Those are the ones that tend to cause cancer because what should we do? Should we be doing endoscopies on them? Should we be doing laryngoscopies on them? So we still don't know 
we know we can tell if they have it. We can tell who's got oral, and we can tell who's got the severe, the the, the scarier strains of HPV. But we still don't know what to do with those men. So we do have a test. We don't know what it means and where to, and where, when, and how to use it yet. Okay, you have the test, but not you. Don't we don't know how to that. how to use it. Like we know how to use the HPV test in women. We don't quite know how to use it in men yet. We do have the test. And also, let me just add, for uh, individuals that are gay, that uh, experience uh, men having sex with men, we actually have a anal pap smear where we scrape rectal tissue and we look for HPV on that. So there's a case where we do often test men. There again, it hasn't been fully validated, but in the gay community, we much more frequently will do the male HPV test. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. That is a great story. Thanks for sharing your history. Now I get where there's a great chemistry, but yeah, we go, we go way back. Someone else says he's a keeper. You mean keeper, like bring him back on my channel as like the, I think that. Oh my God, a zookeeper. <laughs> you never know, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a great, uh, he's smart, right? Do you guys know? Should we bring him back? Should we bring him back on? Talk about weight loss. Talk about, we could do a part two of this. Um, Let's see. Someone says yes to part two. Absolutely. Um, might need to switch mine. If I had the HPV shots about seven to 10 years ago, should I get them again? Great question. Yeah. Because seven to 10 years ago, HPV came out and it was against four strains. Now we have it against nine strains. So my answer is yes, I would definitely do it. Assuming you haven't had a massive number of exposures. And we always argue among the experts, what's a massive number of exposures. And I'll leave that to you. But yes, because you get more, more protection against other cancer-causing strains. And I think that's valuable. An additional five cancer-causing strains you get protection against. And maybe you were exposed to one or two of those in the interval, the last seven or eight years. But I still think it's worth it. It does cost money. So it's a money versus a theoretical infinitesimal small risk with a, a clear benefit. But the benefit is maybe 10% of cervical cancers are caused by these other, maybe 20% of cervical cancers are caused by these strains that the second grouping prevents. Mm. And maybe 70% 70 were, 70 were prevented with the first four in the HPV vaccine that we first did against four strains. And now the additional five strains we vaccinated against, that protects an additional 20% of cancer. So we got 70% protection initially, this adds 20, so we're at about protecting 90%. So the question was, should I go from 70% protected to 90%? And I say yes. Okay, okay. Someone says, my friend got Gardasil, but later was diagnosed with HPV. Does Gardasil not protect against all strains of HPV? I think we talked about that earlier. If you're just well, let, And let me ask, uh -huh. add one other thing. Sometimes you can get HPV just by touching. So some people go, I got the HPV test. I, excuse me. I got the HPV, the Gardasil vaccine. And let's say they got it at age 16 or 18, and I had never had sex before. But what they had had, maybe, was they had done finger touching. And you can pass it from finger to genitals in certain situations. You can pass it rubbing. So if you've never had penetrative sex, you still could have gotten HPV. So some people say, well, I've never had intercourse. But they could have got it with other forms of sexual touching and sexual even kissing. And so it's possible that they got HPV before they got the vaccine or they got a strain that the HPV vaccine doesn't cover. Okay, okay, great. Well, there's some more questions about that. I had HPV and CN3 cells after leap one. I don't know if I'm pronouncing these this are, right. These are things about the pap smear. Okay, um, one year later, tested clear of HPV. Should I now get the vaccine and how long does it last, she said. Great question. Almost certainly your abnormal pap smear was caused by one of the severe types of HPV, usually HPV 16 or 18. Because there's still, I don't know what your age is or how many different partners you've had since you got uh, this diagnosis of the abnormal pap, but your bad HPV went away. You're one of the lucky people that had a bad virus and 90% of the people that have a bad, bad virus is going to go away. 10% it persists and of the 10%, they have a chance of getting cancer down the okay, line. Okay. So my answer to you is yes, but you're only going to get partial protection. I wish you could have got it at age 12 or 13. 
Okay, yeah, so, someone else said, I had the HPV found in me through a routine pelvic exam. Everyone says, Steve, someone, oh, you shared this on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, really important, really important message, right? Yeah, I knew this was really important for everybody. Um, have you ever heard or are you familiar with hydrantitis? Is that something? Can we spell it? Hydrantitis. H-I-D-D-R-A. N I T I T S. It's yeah, like a skin disorder where one experiences boils under arms, groin area. Right. That's a, that's thankfully not an STD, but okay. it, it can affect people when they have when they're having intimate relations. It's a tendency under the armpits and in the groin to get bacterial boils and abscesses, and it's something that sometimes we do surgery to pull out some of that skin. Sometimes we actually, you know have to do really aggressive antibiotic treatment. It's a tough disease, but there are treatments for it and you need to see specialists for it, you know, really good dermatologists uh, because it definitely can affect your intimate relations. Okay, someone else asked, what about vinegar and cheese cloth test used in remote places? I don't know what that means. Do you know what that means? Well, uh, is this some sort of home re remedy to try to diagnose yeast or, or like? bacterial vaginoses or? What are we talking about? I don't know. Maybe give us some more. Give us some more information. Um, can you get a vaccination if you tested positive for HPV? The answer is yes. Okay. Remember, there's 40 strains of HPV, and the current vaccine is a vaccine against nine different strains. So you obviously have one. You know, when I got my HPV vaccine against nine strains, presumably I had been exposed to two, three, four, five of them. And I just wanted whatever protection I could get since I got it at a much, uh, a much later date. Uh, so I, I believe in the vaccine so much in terms of the low risk profile that I would take it later in life, just because this risk of cancer is something that that has to be addressed. You know, and by the way, when we're talking cancer, we better also have the hepatitis vaccine and the hepatitis A vaccine as well. Those are the other. STDs that we have effective vaccination against. Okay. Okay. Um, everyone's saying we'd love to hear about weight loss. I might have to bring you back and talk about that <laughs> a little bit, maybe in like next month or something. Would that work for you? Sure. Um, okay. Everyone's saying doc knows his stuff. Yes, he does. <laughs> um, let's see. Can guys use that same test at home? We're talking about the oral gargle for HPV. Which test are you talking about? Maybe let us know. That's, that's a great question. What to do after diagnosis? Um, after which diagnosis? Ty type in some more. Type in some more. <laughs> um, well, we'll just we'll just say after diagnosis of the HPV. Okay. Um, you have to sit tight. Fortunately, HPV infects you, and that's either with a cancer-causing strain or a wart-causing strain. Fortunately, ninety percent of the time the disease goes away in two years. That's why some doctors are fear mongers and they do a pap smear or they, they detect HPV and they go, whoa, we're gonna have to do this, this, this. No, you're gonna sit back and you're gonna wait for two years and see if the disease abates, if it remits completely on its own. If it doesn't, that's when we have to get busy and do uh, more aggressive screening and treatment. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, someone says, bring him back. This is so incredibly helpful because people are ashamed to discuss this during doctor's appointments. Wrong, there's so much wrong info out there, like supplements, keep up the great work. Well, um, let's talk about stigma. Mm -hmm. you're, you're a relationship expert. Why are doctors, why are individuals, why is everyone in America so afraid to talk about this? Why are people in a panic even at the mention of rectal intercourse, why why is that just so verbose? I don't know. You know, I read, I saw somewhere, I did read part of your book that uh, where we were talking about stigma, where it's like people have come out against all these different cancers, like different celebrities, like there's this, uh, you know, this is the face of breast cancer and all these things. Nobody came out for some of these STDs, right? Not one celebrity has ever come out and said, I have herpes right. and I'm going to be the face of herpes. Exactly. Not what. Yeah. We have people that say I'm the face of HIV. We have people that say I have HPV. I've gotten cervical cancer. We have celebrities that say I have uh, HPV of the mouth and I have oral cancer. Not one individual has come out and say I'm the face of syphilis. I'm the face of herpes. So we have a long ways to go.
Okay. Okay. Yeah. Everyone wants you to cut. Yeah, everyone says definitely agree. Part two, part two, part two. <laughs> I guess because we're, we're doing a part two. I'm going to make everybody read the book, though. I and know. then they have to be prepared. Then we'll go oh, with, that's a good that'll idea. That'll be part yeah. three. Part three. Anyone <laughs> that's read the book will be part three. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's That's see. a shameless let's pitch. I know That's... that was bad. That was really bad. Um, oh, is there life after diagnosis? So, oh, I would love to hear what you. Well, that's to say that's about a great that. thing because, yeah. as you know, there's all these speaking of you know, uh, social media that Lana is a world expert on. There are all these sites for people with HIV, people with herpes, people with various diagnoses like this, so they can associate together. I'm against that. I don't think people with HIV should be put in that box. I don't think people with herpes have to go to the herpes website and just date people with herpes because mm. I think there's a way around it, but it's being educated. If you have herpes to minimize the chance that you pass it and it's your partner to minimize the chance that they get it, but also not worrying if they get it because it's not that big of a deal, but we have to, we have to do all of that together. And if we just say, Oh, it's banned. Now, nah, can I, can I preview something? I have something on my measly little YouTube channel that has like four <laughs> to five subscribers. I am releasing next Monday. I have this parody I'm doing because there's a dark secret in this TV show called The Bachelor. And the dark secret has something to do with herpes. I'm not going to, I'm not going to reveal it. Can I guess it. what it is right now? I bet I know. What? Okay. No, I won't. I won't do it. I won't, I won't reveal it. I'm not going to let you do it. But Biggest okay. Loser has a, excuse me. The Bachelor TV show has a dark secret and it involves herpes and I'm going to do a parody on it and release it with three women are going to do this parody right when The Bachelor is down to three or four women and I'm going to try to shame them because they're doing something to further stigmatize mm -hmm. herpes and if I can do one thing with this book, you know, we'd like to expose that HIV is treatable, we'd like to expose that HPV, we can wipe off the face of the earth practically 90, 95%. But I also want to take the stigma out of herpes. And I want people to be aware and I want them to minimize the chance they pass it to their partners. But I want the partners to not think it's a big deal. And Bachelor is doing the opposite of that. They are via something they're doing on the show, further stigmatizing that disease. And I want to bring it out. And if everybody on this channel can help me in that endeavor, and, um, you know, either come to my Instagram and, and, and you'll see the link or go to YouTube. I'd really appreciate that. that and would... We have all these people saying we're going to follow your YouTube okay. channel now. Okay. So I'll appreciate post a link to that. I'll post a link to the description. I, I know it's not there now, but I'll do it at the replay. Tiffany says, I know just now seeing info about herpes on commercials, people's people suffering in silence, keep putting the word out. Yeah. So there you go. Amazing. Someone else asked, I heard some sort of vinegar cheesecloth test used in remote villages by doctors for women to detect HPV. Can a similar test be used for men? I've heard of a similar test can be used overnight. I'm going to pass on that, Lana, because I've mm -hmm. never heard of anything like that. And, um, you know, I know nothing about the relative accuracy of those tests. And so I really uh, can't comment, but I, I'm, I'm kind of negative on it because something that straightforward and simple, if it were accurate, I think that I would have heard of it. But I, I if you could send that in, uh, whatever information you have, I will look at it. We'll get back to you in part two. Okay. <laughs> I guess, I guess we are doing a part two, but just asks, what is the age limit for doing an HPV vaccine? Well, we prefer to do it long before any sexual activity. And that includes touching because as I said, HPV can be passed with touching. So we prefer to do it at age 12 and 13 because they haven't had sexual contact and their immune system is better. And they can only they, they can get fully immunized with only two vaccines. However, the vaccine is so helpful and I believe in a in the big sense so safe relative to the risk that the vaccine can be done at any age. And again, the less sexual experience, the younger, the more effective the vaccine is going to be. Okay, great, great information. Heather says, please do a post. Post a link to his Instagram and his YouTube channel. Okay, I will do that. People, <laughs> listen, we did not know. We were. Gonna, I was like, let's just try this for twenty minutes. I don't know if anyone's going to be interested in this. She said I would probably be really boring. That's that's right. Right. <laughs> you know, there would be very few people that come out. No, no, I just, I just didn't know how this was going to go. It's a little different than my normal, than my normal live stream. I'm so glad that you guys are like. We've been going for like an hour and twenty minutes, and we're starving, so we have to go. <laughs> We'll do part two. We'll do part two. We'll set that up. Thank you guys so much. This was amazing. Thank you for staying all the way till the end. I can't.
can't believe it. This Thanks. is a long, this is a longer it. live stream. And then so I'm passionate you. about this. That it's, it's important to yeah. all of us. Yeah. Tell them about your book one more time before we go. Yeah. And so the book is called Sex, Lies, and STDs. And, you know, it really started out with Charlie Sheen and what he went through. And, and I realized that there's so much misinformation and such a, a paucity of accurate information. And doctors are doing such a horrible job in taking care of our country that we're going to have to do a grassroots job on our own. Okay. And that's what this is about. Amazing. Can we do two last questions real quick? They're good. After even after even after a hysterectomy in my 40s and being diagnosed with HPV, is a vaccine still needed? I would say it's it's much it, it's probably not needed because the big risk to women is cervical cancer and you can't get cervical cancer. However, there's a small risk that you could get rectal cancer and a small risk you could get oral cancer. So that's a tough one for me. Uh, probably me, I would do it if I were you, but as a doctor, I would say it's a coin flip. Okay. Wow. Wow. Interesting. Last question. Someone says, curious to know if there are any natural remedies for these STDs. Well, a natural remedy is abstinence, but I think that that's a horrible natural remedy and I wouldn't advise it for anyone. Okay. Yeah, I like that. You said that. Yeah, cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Everyone. And by the way, everyone's going, thank you. This was oh, amazing. Bring it. it back. Bring it back. Bring it back. Um, this is my first time catching you live. It was definitely worth it. Oh, amazing. Thank you guys so much for sticking all the way till the end. I know it's went way longer than we expected, but this was phenomenal. Thank you so much. And um, have a great weekend. I'll talk to you guys again soon.